Hello there. Have you heard the name Bulick Forsyth? I didn't know Bulick, but I am haunted by his story. If you're not familiar, let me share it with you because it is 30 years old this year. Bulick Forsyth was in his 40s and working as a building manager for the London Borough of Lambeth in the 90s. His job was to manage 20 odd properties for the social services department and he was said to be a conscientious and reliable worker. Some people described him as being overzealous, but they also said that his bark was often worse than his bite. On the evening of February 24th, 1993, Bulick left work as normal around 5pm and that would turn out to be the last time that his colleagues at Lambeth Council would see him. The next day he didn't arrive for work and he didn't ring in sick. Now this was highly unusual for the conscientious Mr Forsyth. This concerned his colleagues because he wasn't someone to behave like that and a colleague was sent round to his flat but there was no answer. In the early hours of Friday, February 26, 1993, South London firefighters broke into his flat in Clapham. They found that Bulick had been beaten, his flat had been set alight and the gas tap on his cooker was left to run without a flame. It was a miracle that the entire block didn't blow up. And that, for many people, was the last that they heard about Bulick Forsyth. But the reality is, Bulick's story touches on many areas of investigation that I've been working in for a very long time. I've done a, a great deal of work on establishment abuse, including paedophiles and the cover-ups that result from it. And there is every reason to believe that the unsolved death of Bulick Forsyth is related not only to local politicians, but national politicians. And there are people still walking around in the UK who know what happened to Bulick Forsyth. So let's have a look at the life and background of Bulick Forsyth. Well, in the months before his murder, Bulick had told colleagues at Lambeth Council that he was on the verge of exposing child sexual abuse and corruption within the department. What was curious was that Bulick was bludgeoned to death at the time an internal probe was taking place into alleged sexual abuse at the housing department where he worked. That was the Harris report. And although it's never actually been officially published, it is available and in part to the sterling work of researcher Kathy Fox, who applied for an FOI on a number of reports, including the Harris report. The Harris report shows that there were serious issues taking place at Lambeth Council, including allegations of racism and the abuse of children. The resulting report implicated Lambeth officers as well as police and politicians. The report signed by the chair of the panel, Ethne Harris, states the murder of Bulick Forsyth was seen by some witnesses as a possible outcome for anyone who strayed too far in their investigation or who asked too many questions. It was published internally in December 1993, and it also added that the panel heard evidence about Bulick Forsyth while he was working in social services, speaking to a colleague and telling her he was going to spill the beans. Three days later, he was killed. So what happened? And is Bulick and his family ever likely to receive justice? Well, there have been a number of witnesses who have come forward over the years. One former Lambeth worker has talked, but anonymously. She said Bulick came to her several times and said, with what I'm about to tell you, I'm taking a big risk. What if I was to say that council buildings are being used for child sexual abuse on a regular basis? He told her, people are saying they're using these premises to make films. He was very frightened about something and then he was murdered. So let's unpack this together. As I say, Bulick worked for Lambeth, Lambeth being a South London borough. Um, his responsibilities was premise management. Um, and he also often wrote policy documents on health and safety procedures. So he was somebody who understood about rules and regulations. Generally, he was considered 
um, quite a private person. He kept himself to himself. He lived in Foster Court in Clapham, Southwest Four. He was married to an American woman, Dawn. She was actually pregnant at the time of his murder and planning to join him in Britain. And that he was, by all accounts, extremely excited to be a father to his first child. His daughter, Kiris Forsyth, has in recent years spoken out. She believes that there were some factors that point to him possibly being about to blow the whistle on child abuse at the hands of officials. Kiddis sadly never got to meet her father. She was born three months after Bulick's murder. And she said, police must examine whether my father was killed because of what he knew about child sex abuse in Lambeth and if it was linked to people in power. We know that he told more than one person he was going to expose wrongdoings in the borough shortly before he was murdered and that his killer or killers remain free. And it is a fact that in the Harris report, it details quite clearly that Bulick Forsyth had information that he was about to blow the whistle on. Uh, the other things that we've heard about Bulick Forsyth, primarily from a sort of crime watch reconstruction, was this idea that he was potentially involved in the gay community in some way, and that might have had something to do with his death, which I think is misleading. We don't know any of that to be the truth. Um, and, uh, and I do wonder sometimes, you know, whether the BBC... Uh, are just perfectly happy to um, mislead people when it comes to these issues, because it is a fact that the panorama, that the BBC's panorama on VIP paedophiles was awful, was as misleading as you can get. And I, I unpack that in my film, Paedophiles in Parliament, which is available on YouTube. So going back to this idea that he may have been involved in the gay community. He was often seen with two men going into local shops in the months leading up to his death, um, said to have friends who were part of the Clapham gay scene. Um, local residents said they saw um, a number of men around the area um, to do with Bulick. On the day that uh, Bulick was missing from work. Local residents saw three men in suits carrying folders coming out of Foster Court. They looked official, the resident said. I had never seen them before. The same resident noticed something unusual at the back of the flats. Two well-dressed men sat in a car. The resident said, I've lived here for 18 years and I've never seen a car parked there before. And so what happened? A resident in Foster Court was disturbed at 1 a.m., heard running at the back of a flat at the flats, and the neighbor went to Bulick's flat and saw someone had set fire to the place, and it was just absolute horrendous. Um, families were asleep in other flats. Who would be this sick and crazy to do such a thing? And what was discovered afterwards, which actually backed up what the eyewitness had said, was that documentation was missing from Bulick's flat. The only other thing missing was a silver Rolex. Now, that suggests that it, it could be a burglary, but isn't it also likely? First of all, why would a burglar take documentation. The Rolex, yes, but documentation. Unless that burglar was set up to do this job for a particular reason, and they also took the Rolex through greed or to make people believe that it was a regular robbery, uh, gone horribly wrong. Seriously horribly wrong, though, because it's quite rare and unusual for people who break into homes to then set it on fire and leave gas taps running so everybody else is going to be harmed. The idea clearly was to raise that place to the ground. And the question is why? What was in Bulick Forsyth's flat that people didn't want surfacing? So how likely is it that Bulick Forsyth's murder is linked to Parliament? Highly likely, according to former MP John Mann. Now, John Mann um, used to be a councillor in Lambeth. He handed a dossier over to the Metropolitan Police detailing allegations relating to 22 MPs 
and former MPs, including some who were still active in Parliament at that point. He said 13 former ministers were on the list. He called for an investigation into two suspicious deaths, including Bulick Forsyth, whom he believed were killed because they were planning to hand over significant information about the abuse to authorities. John Mann further claimed that a key witness had come forward providing the address of a Dolphin Square flat, which was used for abuse parties by a network of high profile figures, including politicians and leading members of the judiciary, military and security services. Now, again, I've covered Dolphin Square in my film, Paedophiles in Parliament. It's um, a sit, it, it's blocks of flats, which is very, very close to Parliament, can be rented out on a nightly basis. And it was said to be a place that children were taken to be abused by politicians. And I was told that there was a place I'd never heard of called Dolphin Square. And that's one of the places where there were parties where those boys were going, involving members of Parliament. And uh, I refrain from the detail that I was given. That was given to the police at the time. It's been given many times since. And the police told me about a year into that investigation that somebody on, on high had curtailed the investigation and stopped it. John Mann claimed that he had stumbled across clear evidence of a paedophile ring that boys from Lambeth Children's Home were being abused. He gave it to the police and was then told the evidence and investigation was stopped from on high which is extraordinary and not an unusual story. As someone who has investigated these issues, it is beset with um, politicians or anybody trying to raise awareness of this issue being stopped. That includes police officers being stopped, which brings me to my next point. So what about the police? Well, there are further issues here. Former Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll was assigned the task of investigating Lambeth and primarily the employee, John Carroll. This was Operation Trawler. This took place in July to November 1998. Clive Driscoll had been tasked with the job of investigating a possible paedophile ring operating within Lambeth care homes. And this was after police in Liverpool had arrested a man named John Michael Carroll, who had been accused of very serious offences in Liverpool and Lambeth. And Clive was to oversee the London part of the inquiry, which was Operation Trawler. And his task included a number of things. And some of them were to try and establish if there was paedophile activity in Lambeth. And if so, what? And if anything could be done about it um, to check whether or not the paedophile activity that was known had been had been properly investigated and followed through to, to determine whether there was actually any evidence that any of this activity has infiltrated Lambeth staff or management structures. And, it you know, it was quite significant. But Clive was eventually removed from Operation Trawler. And in fact, it's really interesting because in, in Clive's book, Pursue of the Truth, he states that Bulick Forsyth had discovered pornographic pictures on council property featuring Lambeth Care children and council members and was going to expose the whole operation. Three days before he was killed, he was in a lift in his offices where much of the abuse was said to take place. And Bulick allegedly told a secretary that he was going to spill the beans. Clive Driscoll later claimed he was removed from Operation Trawler because he was investigating local and national politicians as part of the alleged ring. In recent years, Clive has spoken about those inquiries and said it was all too uncomfortable to a lot of people. And the Metropolitan Police um, reopened their inquiries um, into Lambeth and paedophile activity, Operation Trinity. It should be noted that John O'Carroll was someone who had been given the job of a care home manager in Lambeth, despite Lambeth knowing that he had already been convicted for child abuse. He was later convicted of 35 young boys. He was clearly not working alone. 
John Carroll ran the Angel Road Care Home. Teresa Johnson, who also worked there and was a whistleblower. And it was Teresa who claimed that she saw government minister Paul Boateng come and go from the home, something he has denied when he was part of the recent child abuse inquiry. At the time of Teresa's allegations, Boateng was a rising star in Tony Blair's government and had been appointed minister in charge of the police. His wife was in charge of Lambeth's social services. And the child abuse inquiry previously heard that around the time that Paul Boateng was elected as an MP for Brent South in 1987, someone claiming to be Lord Boateng, along with his wife, Lady Janet Boateng, chair of Lambeth Social Services Committee, tried to convince a Southwark officer to give an independent rubber stamp to a fostering application from John Carroll and his wife. The Boatengs have completely denied that this happened. At the child abuse inquiry, Paul Boateng said, my whole life's work as a lawyer and as a politician has been in giving young people a voice, as being an advocate for them. There's no way in which I would be complicit in any cover up of abuse of harm done to children. And Lord Boateng went further and he denied knowing Carol and said he had no recollection of ever meeting him. He further said he had no recollection of ever having been at the Angel Road um, care home facility. And uh, but he was the only minister, now a lord in the House of Lords, who was highlighted in all of this, even though John Mann had said there were 22 MPs that he believed were involved. Again, to be absolutely clear, Paul Boateng has never been charged with anything. There is no reason to believe that he was involved in child abuse in Lambeth. I just find it curious why his was the only name that was put forth. And then he was involved in the child abuse inquiry. The child abuse inquiry covered the Lambeth care homes and it showed that in Lambeth, child abuse was on an industrial scale. 705 former Lambeth children in care alleged sexual abuse, 177 adults connected with Shirley Oaks, which was one of the care homes, um, was implicated in this. It was massive. It was substantial. The child abuse inquiry heard that employees in Lambeth treated children in care as if they were worthless, um, and demonstrated a callous disregard for vulnerable children that they were paid to look after. Um, it really was quite shocking what came to light during the child abuse inquiry. I have interviewed a number of survivors from Lambeth Care Homes. It was just horrendous. It's just ruined some people's lives. And, you know, it, it is quite clear that there was a cover up that took place there. The Harris Report, which I referred to at the start, um, is available online and I would advise anybody to read it. It will be it's been redacted. Um, but it should be noted that Bulick Forsyth is likely not the only victim of this powerful paedophile ring. There are others. And let's have a look at them. There was a caretaker who was murdered in 1989, a former Lambeth caretaker died in an arson attack. Um, and this was after he claimed to have tapes of extremely violent and depraved um, parties which were taking a play, taking place involving children and Lambeth officials. Um, petrol was sprayed through his letterbox of his Stockwell flat before being set alight. He died alongside his wife. Both worked at Lambeth Council. Then there was the attempted murder of... S, only known as S, and she she went to the police. She alleged that she had been raped on council property by local politicians and other known people. She worked for Lambeth Council. She actually had serious injuries. She was treated at King's College Hospital and encouraged to report the matter to the police. Um, it was also found that at least one Lambeth manager was obstructed and delayed the Harris report. 
And so S decided to pursue a private prosecution herself. At the beginning of June 1995, she was attacked by a man at her, uh, at her front door. Petrol was poured down her back and her attack attacker attempted to set her alight, but the match dropped to the ground. Um, thankfully, she was not seriously hurt um, and she refused to drop the case. And But there were more. Many witnesses who worked for Lambeth came forward and they were subjected to attack. It would appear that there were leaks taking place within Lambeth, letting people know who was whistleblowing. The fact is, Bulick Forsyth and others were almost certainly murdered because they knew that there was a paedophile ring at Lambeth Council, which involved local and national politicians. To this day, 30 years later, no one has been charged with the murder of Bulick Forsyth or indeed any of the other people who have been attacked or even murdered. Lambeth Council, like other councils around the UK, has been shown to be an entire system that let hundreds, if not thousands, of children down and almost certainly resulted in the murder of Bulick Forsyth, a council official who wasn't prepared to keep quiet about it. Rest in peace, Bulick Forsyth and other victims of establishment paedophile cover-ups. You may not be able to speak up for yourself, but we are still here and we will keep fighting for you. One day, the truth will out.